City. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed these. Uh, this is number eight of the eight workshop sessions of Varshat uh, Piesani Text of Nakovic, or Workshops in the Writing of Scientific Texts. Uh, today I'll be discussing some practical matters around preparing your PhD thesis or indeed other publications uh, for journals or book chapters, for example. And these practical considerations will take in issues of scope, uh, data, uh, and uh, sample size, and uh, effectively how much is too much, both in terms of doing primary source research and collecting data, but also in terms of uh, uh, how much is too big of a concept to try to resolve in the course of a single article, uh, book chapter, or indeed a PhD. I put some provisos here on this first uh, slide. Uh, it's important that irrespective of what I have to say in the course of this lecture, that you take the advice of your PhD supervisor. Of course, uh, she or he will have advice specific to your topic that must come first always. So these are just general considerations. All of your discussions uh, excuse me, all of your decisions must be made uh, within the context of your discipline as well. So, for example, an archaeologist versus a uh, psychologist uh, versus an economist are, are going to be operating within a different contextual framework. So, again, I, tried to, I will try to structure what I have to say today uh, in such a way so as to be useful to the widest possible group of students, but always think about the specific character of your discipline when making decisions. Lastly, uh, just to reiterate one more time, not everything I say here will be applicable uh, to every academic discipline. Effectively, you're going to be faced with what we might call the history manifesto dilemma. Uh, I mean, as was made uh, clear by David Armitage, uh, and his co-author in the History Manifesto, uh, there is a sense, uh, certainly among North American historians, that uh, PhD students should be doing more to address big issues. You know, it's a, uh, at least they're trying to spawn a movement towards go big or go home, as the English expression is. Uh, they're encouraging students to, again, look at the long durée and to employ big data. You'll hear expressions used such as, uh, you, you should make a splash uh, with your PhD. Uh, and also, on a, a more practical basis, I think almost all PhD students are confronted with the difficulty of explaining to their uh, uh, non-academic friends and, indeed, to their family what they're doing and why they're undertaking their research. And it can be difficult sometimes to convince uh, those within your immediate family and circle of the importance of your topic if it's uh, relatively uh, narrow or uh, concentrated in, in one specific aspect uh, of uh, social science history. On the other hand, uh, you're going to have time constraints. You know, you only have a finite number of years in which to complete your PhD. Uh, the source materials for any uh, topic are either going to be limited by what's, what's available or limited by how much you can collect. For example, if you were uh, doing uh, questionnaires and public surveys as part of a sociology study, and also, you're operating in a crowded field, and as a young academic preparing a PhD or an early phase article, uh, the last thing you want to do is, is to uh, sound as though you're making really big and grandiose claims, which it will be hard for the academic community to, to accept, you know, from a, a young academic PhD student. So these are all practical concerns. Uh, on the one hand, there's the go big or go home pressure to uh, take on big topics. And on the other hand, there are all these practical time constraints, source constraints, and uh, constraints within your field that are going to be uh, uh, pressuring you to uh, take a narrower approach and address a smaller topic. So how do we balance these? 
Uh, well, it, uh, the key word there is balance. There's no right answer exactly, but there are a series of considerations that one has to make when beginning to work uh, through this process of, of conducting research uh, for scientific writing. The, the first uh, question is maybe the biggest here, what of scope? Uh, and I've put at the top of this slide, the shrinkage is normal. Uh, shrinkage is a, uh, it's a, a bit of American slang, but uh, it describes the way in which when we begin any new piece of research, we tend to think about uh, the topic in a very broad context. We might say to ourselves generally, I would like to understand changes in the peasant economy over a 200 year period, you know, say uh, 1550 to 1750. But the reality is once you begin to conduct the research, uh, you'll find that if you're going to adequately address that topic, you need to shorten it, you need to shorten the time span, you need to focus on particular primary sources, uh, and that you will necessarily, over the course of preparing a, an article, or, and especially over the course of preparing a PhD, you will shrink the size of your topic to something more manageable. That's fine, that's a part of the normal process of research, that we start with uh, broad concepts that interest us and we work systematically towards making them manageable. And I would also stress here, uh, and this is what I'll focus on for the next uh, 20 minutes or so, that big versus small is not a binary choice. And uh, this is where I uh, personally disagree with the authors of the the history manifesto, uh, I think that you can both undertake a, a study which is sufficiently narrow so as to really be a master of your topic and at the same time take that study and make it uh, accessible and applicable to a wide audience investigating a wide range of uh, related disciplines and related uh, bodies of research. So I would say that the important uh, first step is to scope your project. That is to say, determine the size of your project or adjust the size of your project in such a way so as that you can collect the kind of raw data and that you can uh, uh, master that data and then use what we call inferred statistics uh, to make that data applicable to a wider time span or a wider range of uh, subjects. So I've offered you some definitions here. Descriptive statistics are uh, those that in where, excuse me, are those that work with simple and complex data and metadata uh, to examine the data set you have. These are for your specific uh, time or area or dimension of research. So this is the data, the qualitative or indeed quantitative data for your uh, narrow uh, specific point of interest. Now if you're uncertain about these terms, complex, uh, simple data, metadata, you can go back and revisit, uh, I believe it's the session four lecture, uh, which is available on YouTube. Uh, in which I, I set out what these terms mean in the context of uh, a quantitative history. Now, if you want to produce a piece of research which is going to be useful uh, beyond your narrow time or area of study, then you might employ some inter, uh, inferential statistics and inferential methods. And I give you a definition here of inferential statistics from Pat Hudson's a volume history by numbers. She describes inferential statistics as, and I quote, an attempt to take statistical knowledge which is given and to use it to infer information or to generalize about other times, other places, or populations. Uh, this could also be termed uh, a comparative method. But I think there's a difference between writing a solid journal article or indeed a PhD which focuses on 
one narrower body of primary source material or one narrower uh, period in time, and then says, okay, can we compare this to other times? And on the other hand, really more expressly comparative work where the, the study itself is designed around a comparison between two places or two data sets or two time periods. I think it's good practice for all PhD students to uh, employ uh, inferential methods and inferential statistics as much as they reasonably can within a PhD. If you make yourself expert on one narrow set of data, one narrow point of time, but you can convince others realistically and honestly that that can tell you a lot about similar uh, events or similar uh, uh, patterns at a different point in time in a different place, then that's where your research really takes on a kind of wider meaning to the academic community. Inferential statistics and inferential methods, which are not limited to just uh, quantitative work, but certainly also can be employed in qualitative work, even on, say, literature, for example, uh, they employ what we call a probability theory. So probability theory is used uh, where you can't uh, uh, repeat an experiment uh, to test a hypothesis. So uh, probability is the likelihood that something will happen again and particularly that it will happen again in the same way. Now, if, if, we, were, uh, if we were doing a, a study on sleep deprivation, for example, we could look at the effect of sleep deprivation when you have three hours sleep, then we could uh, bring in the same group of people and look at the effects of only having two hours sleep and do it again and look at the effects of only having one hour sleep. And so we can keep repeating uh, repeating that study again and again. In that case, you can just uh, produce more and more descriptive, descriptive statistics until your work is done. But in the social sciences generally, the type of things we examine are more like, for example, uh, social responses to crisis situations. And so we're interesting in, as uh, academics well be, uh, looking at now in 50 years time, interested in how people will respond to crisis. Now, obviously, you can't change the parameters of that crisis a little bit and rerun the experiment because it's not something you can repeat, nor is it something you'd want to repeat. And so what we have to do is, is try, and, uh, try and determine the kind of root nature of the response to crisis, to limit it to a, a specific sort of number of aspects or variables and then uh, to try and compare that to other situations that where the same variables exist and to infer the transferability of your model from your period of study or topic of study to those other circumstances with similar variables. <coughs> I'll give you an example of a sort of simple probabilities here, just in case you're not clear about the definition of probabilities. Imagine if we were playing a game of dice and we had one six-sided die. Uh, each time we roll that die, there is a one in six chance uh, that it's going to uh, land and display the number one. Okay, so it's a six-sided die. We throw it. There is a one in six chance of any particular number coming up. Think of that as your kind of descriptive statistics. On the other hand, uh, if we were to roll that, uh, if we were to roll that dice, maybe just two or three times, once we might get one as a result, the next time we might get three as a result, the next time we might get five as a result. You know, it's not really clear how broadly applicable that is. But if we have a lot of data, and we, we keep rolling that die again and again until we've rolled it 600 times, then the big picture will again come back and reflect the, the underlying uh, probability. So if you were to roll a die 600 times, uh, probably 60 of those times, it'll come up with each possible number. 
I hope I've, I've made that clear. Uh, it's just to say that it, it, when you collect more data, you can get a better uh, understanding of the overlying probability. And then once you know what the, the kind of probability is, then you can apply that in a different circumstance. Like if we had run this experiment of rolling a six-sided die uh, several times, we determined that more or less out of 600 rolls of the die, each number turns up 60 times, then we could say, okay, I understand how probability works. Uh, if it's a six-sided die, there is a one in six chance we're going to get any given number. We can now apply that knowledge and say if we had a 20-sided a, uh, die and we rolled it, we know from experience that there's a one in 20 chance that any given number will turn up. Uh, and so we can take that model and move it uh, to a different framework. Changes in conditions, uh, of course, then change the outcome. As I indicated here, if you go from a six-sided die uh, to a seven-sided die, then the chance of any given number coming up goes from one in six to one in seven. So changes in conditions change the probable outcome. And so if we have a sense of the probability of something, uh, say market behavior in the uh, economy, whether that's the modern historic economy, then we can reasonably guess what the effect of changing one parameter will be. And then we can look at uh, maybe our core study and then say, look at a comparative second time period and say, ah, I can see there's one key parameter that's different. Let's adjust for that. And now our research, uh, broadly speaking, can be applicable in that circumstance too. Uh, I've put here an article that you might choose to look at by uh, H. Russell Bernard, uh, The Science of Social Science in the Proceedings of the uh, National Science Academy of the United States of America, of uh, Volume 109. It, it's available on uh, JSTOR if you want to log in and have a look at it. It's just a nice little piece that gives us an indication of the uh, nice little piece that gives us an indication of, of the value of uh, probability and uh, statistics and social sciences over the last hundred years. Uh, sample size is uh, incredibly important, uh, and and this is again it's it's this aspect of scope. How how much time do we have to spec spend collecting data? How much data do we need to collect? And keep in mind that when I say data, that can be anything from uh, looking at thousands of government records to choosing how many, uh, uh, how many pieces of writing by a particular author we're going to look at to determine their linguistic style. So data is a very broad definition here. Probability theory, uh, is reliant upon having good, uh, having good valid data. Now, so that we can determine a good valid probability, apply that not only within the narrow bounds of our study, but in other studies as well. So uh, probability uh, can be, excuse me, probability theory needs a valid uh, sample and valid data. And we can determine whether a sample is internally valid uh, based largely on our kind of natural expectations. Are we comparing apples with apples or are we comparing apples with oranges? For example, if you're going to do a study of tax, uh, there's a big difference between uh, direct taxation and indirect taxation on services and so forth. And so you wouldn't compare those two things. Having internally valid data means that the, the uh, uh, the data within your sample are, are consistent in the nature within themselves. So we might be looking, for example, only at uh, income tax data. But the data also has it within a sample when you're determining how much data to collect for an article or PhD, it also needs to be externally valid. And this is really where PhD students tend to, uh, tend to fail or where they tend to make mistakes. Externally valid data means Okay, you're, when you look at your data points, how representative are they? So, for example, if, if we were sampling uh, the spending habits of individuals within a community, we might say, 
the state is internally consistent. We're only looking uh, at people living within uh, Torun, for example. But is it externally valid? I.e., when you're choosing people for your sample, are they representative of that society as a whole? Uh, are the, is the sample representative of the key aspects you're looking at? Because uh, people might have different spending habits depending on age, gender, income, locality, which part of the city they live in, a poor neighborhood versus a wealthy neighborhood. And so balancing those aspects uh, give you external sample validity. So it's important Again, this sounds like I'm speaking in terms of, of mathematics, but really this applies to everything. Uh, you need to have both internal validity and external validity. So internal validity, am I looking at the same type of source material? And then external validity says within my sample, since I can't possibly gather every possible data point. I can't check every single record in the archive. I have to choose certain records to evaluate. Are those records, though they're all about the same topic, are they representative of the possible variations within the group? Here, if we were talking about the spending habits of individuals, we might say a community is representative of old people, young people, men and women, and so we need to have some, some uh, data points within our sample representing that whole range. Now, there are uh, formal methods of determining whether your data set has uh, external validity. And uh, probably the most uh, famous of these is, is a proximal similarity model, uh, which is developed, or uh, for, this is a phrase first coined by uh, Donald Campbell, back in the, the 1960s, I think his original article is in 1963. And he, he simply says, effectively, if you're going to do sampling, for example, sampling of individuals in a community, uh, you need to be thinking about, uh, are they in a similar place uh, geographically? Uh, do your data points represent a similar point in time? Do they represent, say, a similar social strata? Do they represent people living within a similar cultural model, which might dictate their spending habits? If, again, if we stick with this example of spending habits. Uh, and then we have to ask ourselves, will any differences uh, in the similarity of these people affect the specific research finding we're looking for? So. Uh, if we were looking at the habits of uh, vegetable buying, it might be that uh, whether you're male or female doesn't have much impact on uh, how many carrots you buy. But if we were looking at, for example, how much people spend in rent, then the difference between young people and old people is going to be very great because when we're young, we tend to have less money and to rent cheap apartments. When we're old, we have more money and tend to to own or to rent an expensive place to live. Uh, and so we have to ask whether or not the, the dissimilarities within the group, uh, within your sample, are going to directly affect the specific item you're uh, seeking to research. A uh, sampling frame is uh, another kind of external validity problem. Sampling frame is the uh, uh, term we use to describe limitations that are placed uh, on your capacity to select items to look at. So for example, you want to do a, a study on, uh, I don't know, impression, the work of impressionist artists, for example. You're interested in the, in the kind of brush typically used by impressionist artists for the, those characteristically broader, more kind of you know, messy brush strokes of impressionists. Well, it might be that uh, if you could look at all of the famous impressionist artists of the 1920s, in an ideal world, you would choose the work of, uh, you, you would look at, say, 300 works of art uh, distributed equally across uh, you know, French, German, and Dutch artists, something like this. But in reality, 
your sampling frame, if you're working uh, in Poland, might be limited to the art available in three or four museums that are near enough to you that you can travel to them. Uh, now, does that limited sampling frames, is that going to systematically alter the outcome of your research? It, it may, because if most of the Impressionist art you could look at in nearby museums is produced by uh, German and Polish artists, they're, maybe they're all tending to buy brushes from two or three manufacturers that are local um, to West Poland or East uh, Germany, and therefore, uh, you know, you're not going to see the complete picture that you would get if you could also look at the type of brushes used by uh, Dutch and French artists. So your sampling frame, uh, again, is an as aspect of external uh, validity. And so what you're looking for here is to, to the best of your ability, find a way to uh, sample the source material, the primary source material for your PhD in such a way so as it has both internal validity, you're comparing like with like, but it also has external validity. That's to say it's it's representative of all of the, the possible subsets within your primary source uh, selection, and that also it, it doesn't suffer from any uh, serious sampling frame uh, issues. If you, for, with this example of uh, examining art, maybe only within certain collections, if that uh, sampling frame issue is consistent throughout the PhD, then of course, you would just want to alter the PhD so as to argue that it only reflects that aspect. Of course, there, there are neo-Marxist problems here as well. Uh, if we were operating in the sciences or social sciences 30 years ago, we would have said that there are certain sort of uh, uh, accepted facts and that those facts can be used to kind of help us establish the validity of our primary sources that we're sampling uh, to complete a PhD. Uh, and this is, a, I indicated as a neo-Marxist problem here because this is a, an area in which ideologies can seriously uh, sort of twist the outcomes of research. For example here, uh, we assume or certainly until the last uh, 20 years, we assumed certain universal aspects of human behavior. I think probably one that we would all agree on even today uh, as a default aspect of human behavior or psychology is that uh, we can all agree that it's better to be alive than to be dead. Uh, in fact, universal agreement on that point, more or less universal agreement on that point, is what has allowed governments to very severely uh, restrict uh, the capacity of people to move around during the coronavirus because we we generally believe that it can cause death and everyone agrees it's better to be alive than dead. Uh, it used to also be uh, understood to be basic maximums in the social sciences, well, under, uh, well understood as, as uh, irrefutable fact that uh, people will always tend to maximize their income or to maximize benefit to themselves. So that might be either money coming in or the amount of food available to them or how big a house they can have. And also that people are naturally risk averse. And so uh, people will tend to stick to what they're comfortable with, stick to what they know dependably brings them money or food or prosperity rather than take a risk. Uh, uh, it's been argued that, that these assumptions, of course, in a way reflect a, a kind of underlying uh, Western European un, uh, belief in the existence of original sin. If we think of gluttony as a sin, uh, very broadly speaking, a desire to, to uh, eat more than we really should, to, to take more than we should have, uh, that that represents a kind of basic human instinct that's uh, framed up as original sin. Uh, and so these, these things used to be uh, taken as universal truths, understood as universal truths. And most of the social science of the 20th century relies on these basic assumptions. 
but in the last 20 years especially, there's been a, a, a really precocious rise in uh, the social sciences and humanities, especially in North American and Western U European universities, in a neo-Marxist reworking of our understanding of human nature in the past. So the idea is not that there are, are constants uh, in neo-Marxist terms, there's an idea that there are not constants of universal human behavior that in every individual will uh, exhibit, but rather that there are constants of group behavior. And that uh, uh, when you group people, that, that individual groups tend to make these decisions and that the, the group decision tends to be more important or the group framework is more important uh, than the individual uh, than the individual worldview. Uh, I mean, this brings up all kinds of problems here. Uh, the classic sort of Marxist way to view people, of course, would be kind of peasants and the bourgeoisie, those who own the means of production and those who do the producing, shall we say. Uh, but the, the modern divisions, of course, include uh, uh, typically identity or race divisions. Are you black or white? And, and I've put Hispanic here as well because this is a, a deeply problematic one. Uh, the United States, for example, most North American uh, public entities, you know, whether this is Canada as well, uh, use this word Hispanic. But Hispanic means of uh, effectively of uh, Spanish speaking cultural tradition. And so you have people who are Hispanic who are white but you also have people who are Hispanic who are who have skin that is is darker or brown or they're more uh, maybe better described as Native Americans of uh, North or South America. And so uh, it's a term that becomes kind of scientifically becomes meaningless, right? Because it's a, it's a label that can't be directly associated with with specific characteristics. And in, in fact, in a, in a way, peasant or bourgeois is just as problematic, and indeed, a white or black is just as problematic. Neo-Marxist interpretations of the world around us are <laughs> festooned with direct contradictions, so don't be too surprised. And uh, these kind of interpretations ask regularly, are, are we really an individual? Can I, as an individual, or you, as an individual, make a decision? Or are your decisions so structured by your cultural and social framework that you only think you're making decisions? You know, I think I gave in, in class this example of uh, um, the statistic that in, in London, I think it's 80% of knife crime is... Uh, uh, committed by black British persons. And the new Marxist interpretation is that even within the same neighborhood, if you have uh, two young men, one black and one white, deciding whether to take a knife with them when they leave the house, that that decision is not one made by the white individual and the black individual. It's effectively a decision that's made by the, the cultural milieu, so that the black individual might have an experience of living in an environment where he feels that he can't trust the police to keep him safe. The only way he can be safe is to protect himself, i.e. to carry the knife. Whereas the white individual identifies with the police and feels like if they have a problem, the police will protect them and therefore they don't feel the need to take the knife. And so each person thinks they're making the decision whether or not to carry the knife, but in fact it's the social framework. Uh, that's, the, in essence, the, the neo-Marxist position. And there's also the stem from that. Uh, and again, this is a, a kind of direct contradiction within the neo-Marxist framework. There tends to be a, 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 an expectation among neo-Marxists that uh, every individual will have their truth, that there is no such thing as objective truth, that your truth is the way in which you perceive the world around you based on the framework inside which you live. So your truth as a young black woman will be different from a young white woman 
as a young rich person will be different from a young poor person, that there is no objective truth, that it's all subjective. Um, that's difficult uh, because it makes almost any kind of humanities and social science research almost impossible to uh, develop with sort of strong, clear, uh, what we would think of as kind of rational scientific arguments, because a neo-Marxist can always come along and say, <laughs> you know, have you thought about the way in which the person experiencing what you're researching would have viewed it? Because that's actually more valid than your analytical assessment. And so you, you get these uh, new fields like feminist glaciology, or feminist mathematics, that somehow mathematics and glaciology are fields that have been dominated by men, and therefore the, what we think we know as science in those fields, in fact, isn't real. It's, it's somehow a kind of a representation of a male view of mathematics or a male view of glaciology. Uh, it's a little mind bending, um, but of course, I mean, I, I'll openly admit that I, I am very, very strongly against new Marxist interpretations of the world around us. Uh, and therefore, I always give students this question I've put at the bottom of the slide here to represent how crazy I think it is. What, imagine, imagine asking this question to a, uh, uh, an engineer designing a bridge saying, what is your truth for the necessary strength of that bridge to carry 100 cars? And all, all I've got to say is that you better get the same answer from every single person you ask that, every single engineer you ask that question of, or somebody's bridge is going to fall down <laughs> and a lot of people are going to be killed because uh, we can say from the older tradition of hard science that was dominated until the end of the 20th century that each car has a certain weight and the bridge had better be able to support uh, the weight of 100 cars or it's going to fall down that that that's not subjective that's objective you know uh, any rate read all about neo-marxist modern interpretations uh, to your heart's content, but I'll just finish here by saying you need to be very sensitive to the existence of these because certainly North America remains a powerhouse of university uh, academic publication and uh, people in the social sciences and particularly the humanities in North American universities now have a genuine deep and heartfelt belief in the correctness, the factual correctness of a neo-Marxist uh, worldview. Uh, I, on the other hand, uh, think they've lost their minds, but that's just me. Uh, I, in defense, I say neo Marxists also believe that any interpretation is a valid interpretation, and so I, I guess my interpretation is valid. I'll finish up here uh, just with a couple of short slides. Now, this one again is about this vexed question of how much data do you need to collect to prepare a PhD or a book chapter or an article? You know, how, how big does a sample have to be to give you a representative uh, view of what you're researching? Uh, and again, this is about the relevance of your work, not just statistics, because if you are looking, uh, say, for example, you could write an entire PhD about the life of one factory worker in 1930 based on tax records and other things, no one would care unless you can prove that with all of the data from that one factory worker that that individual is truly representative of a much bigger group and not just an outlier. And even just establishing that uh, is going to require you to sample other factory workers to see how, how typical this individual is. Because if they're totally unusual, if they are one person and no one else in the world was like them, then researching them doesn't really tell us anything useful. Uh, there are two approaches to sample size. There, there's a sort of strictly quantitative aspect here. So 
if you're undertaking sort of hardcore quantitative research, say on the 20th century economy or some aspect of it, uh, then you and you have an infinite amount of uh, perfectly uniform data available to you, then you can mathematically determine how big a sample size needs to be uh, to be representative. Uh, uh, in terms of mathematical systems for doing so, you, you take into account uh, group size, margin of error uh, that you're willing to accept, you know, uh, confidence level, you know, for example, you read in, in polling in, in the press, this public opinion poll is correct plus or minus 5%, so your confidence level, and the, the standard deviation. Now, I'll come back to standard deviation in a moment, um, but suffice it to say, standard, what you want is a one degree of standard deviation plus or minus because that incorporates uh, typically uh, incorporates you know the majority uh, sixty eight percent typically the majority of uh, 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 data points within any given group probably much more I mean and you can go on the internet and read about mathematical models for determining sample size. Uh, until your your eyes fall out. Uh, <laughs> there's plenty of that. What's more important to us as a social uh, scientist, generally speaking, I think is is a qualitative research. And uh, here, sample size is determined by much more heuristic methods. Typically, uh, there are some very complex mathematical approaches, but if, generally speaking. Uh, for most historians or sociologists, for example, heuristic solutions are used. So we say, okay, I've taken a sample of something. Maybe I have a, a, a thousand documents and I've looked at 50. Uh, if I repeat that exercise, so I, I select a, a different random 50 documents, tabulate the information contained in them, are the results more or less the same? That's to say, uh, is it repeatable? And so if, if you undertake a, a sample exercise and collect data, you can then maybe go back and, and uh, do a second sample. And if the data looks about the same as the first sample, then the first sample is big enough. That's a really blunt instrument, a really basic way of, of feeling confident your sample size was enough. A more scientific way would be to think about a, a kind of bell curve and standard deviations. Um, generally speaking, if we uh, if we sample most things, we will get a what we call a kind of uh, a bell curve or a standard deviation curve, which is to say we'll have a, at either end, uh, we will have a small number. Say if we were looking at uh, tax income, for example, we'll have a very small number of people at one extreme end. Uh, of, uh, maybe I actually scratch that. Uh, IQ is a better example, a standard IQ. So if we were surveying people to determine IQ, we'll have a very small number of people at one extreme end who are much less intelligent than normal, a very small number of people at the other extreme end who are much more intelligent than normal, all of you, I'm sure, as PhD students. Uh, and then most people will fit in the middle. And you'll see this here on this uh, bell curve. Uh, on the image of this slide, and we, we have a so-called a so-called uh, uh, so 68, 95, 97 percent rule, and that's to say that if we if we produce this bell curve and at one ex and we chart we plot things along the x and y axis that's axis let's say the horizontal and the vertical axes, and we go out to a point where we have the smallest number at one end and the largest number at the other. And then we draw a line right through the center that should be through the uh, center of the curve. <coughs> and then effectively we, we uh, divide the distance from the center to the right and distance from the center to the left into three equal portions. Typically on a, a typical bell curve, uh, what you'll find is that uh, one standard deviation left or right that's plus one or minus one in this table will, will take in 68% uh, of, of all uh, material, all sample points within the bell curve. 
uh, two standard deviations, plus or minus, will take in uh, 95, and three standard deviations, plus or minus, will take in, uh, well, eff effectively 100%. And so we tend to think in, in standard deviations. So uh, what you do is you, you start collecting data, like imagining you, you're sampling whatever kind of data it is, but if you can, you can uh, quantify in some way, if you can, uh, if you can give a value, uh, a value to each kind of document and you are making sure that your sample is representative of the whole pile of documents, well, you, you should find that uh, as you keep sampling, that your distri distribution will tend to uh, shape into this curve. And, and once you've sampled enough that you can see reflected in your data this kind of bell curve, then you know effectively that you have sampled enough, that you can see the, the nature of the distribution. Uh, again, that's a little bit of a blunt instrument, and then there are exceptions to that, but in a very general sense, it's true. Um, and these are methods to make sure that you've sampled sufficient material so that you can uh, take your results and reasonably argue that they uh, provide an informative parallel to other time frames. Uh, for example, if you were looking at a phenomenon, an economic phenomenon within history based on certain variables, certain criteria, and you collect enough data, uh, say we were looking at uh, uh, borrowing habits of people going to a bank and borrowing money against the context of a liquidity crisis, we could sample uh, data determining how much money people borrowed until we saw this kind of a, a distribution, a bell curve distribution. And then uh, we know that we've sampled enough to, to uh, uh, say, okay, we can see the shape of behavior. Now let's go to another liquidity crisis and look at borrowing habits, and we can use this as a model to check against that other, uh, uh, that other instance without having to redo all the research. And in this way, you can take the, your own narrow body of research and make it applicable to a much wider, uh, much wider scenario. I know it sounds and it looks a little bit like I'm talking here about uh, quantitative material, but indeed I'm also talking about qualitative material. Imagine if you were sampling documents uh, within a, a sort of medieval archive, you just have a big pile of thousands of documents and you that represent the work of some medieval scribe or even a medieval author. You're looking at a letter collection. What you do is you start kind of classifying the letters in such a way that you can assign them values and then you can uh, put those values on this kind of a, uh, of a distribution. Uh, and work out when you've got a reasonably full sample. Um, a good sample is important. Sample size is important to show that you can produce research which is, uh, you know, applicable in other circumstances, that you can make connections with other social sciences that use other kind of uh, similar methods. Um, because you're constantly trying to answer these questions, you know, imagine a, a really cynical observer saying to you, why should I care about your research? What does this tell us about the wider world, about uh, society at large, or about a long period of history? How much is too much in a PhD? And we're getting right down to the bitter end here, uh, bitter end of the lecture, I should say. Primary source work, uh, it is always very difficult to draw to a close. So everyone starts a PhD, they're going to do lots of primary source research, you're going to generate data or work in an archive, and uh, it's very hard to feel confident you have enough. And there are some, some basic uh, sort of variables that are gonna tell us how you should distribute your time in the writing of a PhD. You need to ask yourself, is this PhD a data-driven piece? Or is it a piece that is data informed? So data driven means my PhD is basically about collecting a certain kind of data that I believe is going to be informative and analyzing it. Uh, you might get that in economics, for example. On the other hand, if you were talking about literature, 
You might say, no, this is a PhD mostly about style, uh, about the, the psychological sort of frame of mind of various authors, and data when I collect it about the use of certain verbs, the frequency of using certain words, for example, orthography, uh, we're talking about other uh, you know, handwriting. We could say those are data that are collected just to check, just to verify my uh, qualitative argument. So we're talking here about a primarily quantitative data-driven thesis versus a primarily qualitative data-informed thesis. If you have a primarily data-driven thesis, then you've really got to do your data collection, more or less do all of it before you start the analysis. And so that's going to structure how you distribute your time, clearly. Are you going to work on a, a data-informed thesis and then you have a greater capacity to do some research and then some writing of results, and then some more research, some more writing results. And I think in a broad brush strokes, that's the first thing you need to think about. You know, what, what is the nature of my PhD? Is it data driven or data informed? You know, is it mostly quantitative or is it mostly qualitative? The second thing you, you need to think about is the fact that there are different traditional approaches to a PhD, and your PhD supervisor will probably represent one of these. And the two main approaches are really a very old approach in which no matter what your topic, qualitative or quantitative, uh, students used to be told mostly, go away and do all of your research and then begin writing. Uh, newer approaches, uh, these days, we're told monitor students very closely. And so that encourages supervisors to say to the students, write a chapter, just get writing. It doesn't matter if it's bad. It doesn't matter if later you will have to go back and rewrite it. Just get writing, you know, so that I can see that you're making progress. And that is beneficial for some people because of their personal habits. They need that pressure to make them work. Also, it can be beneficial in ensuring that a student completes a PhD because there's a certain type of individual that can do all of the research and then write it all under in intense pressure. And there's a, a certain other type of person that if they had to do all of the writing in one block at the end would be psychologically overwhelmed by this and not able to complete. So you also need to think about your kind of personal psychological habits, you know, and your own character as well what's going to work for you. There's some pitfalls generally here. Don't overwork your points. Uh, people go into a PhD thinking I have, I have, uh, I feel I've discovered, you know, certain things that are really important. And then they might tend to labor over those points for a really significant portion of their PhD and ultimately end up sort of, uh, as we say in English sometimes, uh, spreading butter over too much toast. You know, you try to make too much out of uh, certain points. Be guided by the significance of, of the find. If, if you find something that's interesting and is new information to the academic community, but is only going to be uh, really useful to a small group of other academics, take note of it. Make it clear that you've made this discovery and then move on. Uh, on the other hand, if, if you have done a really extensive analysis on a, a body of data that, that throws up a lot of points, then spend more of your thesis on that material. Structure and balance uh, uh, matter, but you have to be sensitive to the, re re the uh, realistic limitations of your primary source material. Now, what I mean by that is you might have, at an early stage, drawn up a plan for your PhD where you say, I'm going to have four chapters. One of those four chapters is going to be on one, one specific aspect of history or economics or sociology, right? But when you finish collecting all your data, you find that you only have data a very small amount of data useful to that one point. Do not try to write one quarter of your PhD with one tenth of your data. It's, it's going to be thin. It's going to look like weak research. 
don't be afraid to restructure the PhD so that the PhD focuses overwhelmingly on your uh, the best results that you have produced. Be flexible. You can't always answer all of the specific research questions that you set out to answer. Uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes you're, you're much better off to say, okay, I really wanted to answer question A, but there really just wasn't enough data. However, I've discovered uh, lots of data on topic B that give us really new and exciting uh, research findings. And so move your focus uh, to point B. I've seen a lot of, of very good PhD students try to force a PhD uh, to reflect results that, that just weren't there in their data while ignoring other really important uh, research findings that are just kind of mentioned in passing in the same PhD. Follow the data. Do not try to write exhaustive chapters one right after the next. This is another important point. Write a draft chapter of every, excuse me, write a draft of each chapter. If you write a draft of chapter one, it will be crap. You write a draft of chapter two, it'll be a little better. You write a draft of chapter three, and by then you will have become aware of a, a whole bunch of additional information that relates to chapter one. Uh, and so you're going to have to go back and rewrite it anyway. You'll probably discover new, new data, a new source. So don't spend ages trying to draft an absolutely perfect chapter the first time around. Do a kind of rough draft of each chapter and expect to have to come back and include new data, maybe even gather a little more data uh, to rewrite each chapter in turn. I mean, I know that's obvious to all of you that you need to write a draft of something and then come back and improve it. But it might not be obvious that you should write a draft of a PhD chapter and then don't worry about it for the next two years. Come back to it at the end and then rewrite it because you will have new uh, data. Lastly, enjoy yourself. Uh, when you can't bear to write anymore, take a break. Don't try and force yourself. I mean, um, this is a PhD. It's not writing a, a uh, undergraduate essay the night before. If you reach a point where you're, you're hating what you're doing, then your progress, your productivity for each hour will go down and down. You really need to take a break when you need it. So that's it. Uh, good luck. Uh, I uh, hope that I'm able to meet you in the classroom at the end of April and look at and uh, take in your three minute theses in which you hopefully have applied some of the information that's been delivered through these workshops. Uh, if that's not possible uh, due to the coronavirus, then I look forward to reading the transcripts of your uh, three-minute thesis presentations in due course. Uh, please do email me with any questions you may have, and I hope you've enjoyed this lecture series. Thank you.